Please subscribe, like, and share. It really helps us out. And of course, if you have any questions, comment below and we will answer you as soon as we can. Welcome to this video in our series on A-Level Economics. In today's lesson, we will be learning about Unit 4.4 The Financial Sector. Role of Financial Markets. Market Failure in the Financial Sector. Role of Central Banks. If you haven't seen our previous videos, click on the card above. What is the role of financial markets? The role of the financial markets is to a facilitate saving and b lend to businesses and individuals. This is providing finance. These are often called financial intermediation. The bank or more generally, the financial system brings together savers and borrowers. Another way of saying this is that they act as intermediates. Like banks, equity and bond markets provide finance to corporate borrowers. They also see facilitate the exchange of goods and services but making payments. Another role is to D. Provide forward markets and currencies and commodities. This is when the price of a financial instrument or asset is set today but the transaction will take place at some future date. Contracts entered into the forward market are binding on the parties involved and cover financial instruments such as foreign currencies, as well as assets such as commodities. An example would be TIN. This is an example of risk sharing and insurance, another key function of the financial system. The future price of a farmer's crop at harvest is uncertain, but if the farmer buys a futures contract they can fix the price today and be certain of the price they'll get for their crop. This is a type of financial insurance where the farmer has sold, or shared, their risk to the futures market. Something else they do is E. Provide a market for equities and corporate bonds in which businesses can raise money to invest in new capacity. This is a market in which shares are issued and traded, also known as the stock market. Shares provide part ownership in a company and provide a company with capital, which is an important source of finance for a business. Also, these are markets for government bonds where the government sells debt to raise money to finance the public sector deficit, in the UK this is the market for gilt-edged securities or gilts. Now, let's look at market failure in the financial sector. Firstly, speculation and market bubbles. A speculative bubble is a spike in the value of an asset, typically house prices or stock market values. They can also be referred to as a market bubble. Poor lending decisions by bankers can help to fuel a market bubble, for example through irresponsible mortgage lending. A speculative bubble is normally caused by exaggerated expectations of future growth in the value of an asset. Investors believe that the value will rise and so, with heightened expectations, this causes the value to further inflate beyond what an objective assessment would suggest. Once belief sets in that the asset has reached its peak value, investors will quickly try to sell, causing the artificially high value to fall. As the bubble bursts, there is usually a fall in confidence and aggregate demand in the economy. The wealth effect on consumption. The bursting of the housing bubble in the US, combined with the risky trading in subprime mortgages, worked together to cause the global financial crisis of 2008. The trade in CDOs, or collateralized debt obligations, between banks proved to be one of the prime causes of the financial crisis. Mortgages in the subprime market, originating in the US, had been given to borrowers who effectively stood no long-term chance of paying them back. This was not a problem for the lender provided house prices continued to rise, since they could recover their loan by forcing the sale of the house. These mortgages were packaged up with other loans and sold on to other banks through CDOs. Many were bought by financial institutions that did not fully realize just how poor the creditworthiness of the original mortgage borrowers had been, and to what extent their bundle was exposed to this. When the US house prices collapsed, it became clear that many of these CDOs were toxic assets, meaning they were effectively worth much less than buyers had expected. Individual banks did not know to what extent other banks were exposed to these. The banking system requires banks to lend to each other, but the banks were worried about lending to each other since they did not know which ones were creditworthy. Interbank lending collapsed and credit became scarce and more expensive for everyone. It should be noted that a spike in the price of an asset may be the result of the normal interaction of supply and demand rather than speculation. 
For example, the price of a crop might spike sharply after a bad harvest. In this case, the shortage of supply relative to demand is pushing up the price, with no speculation involved. Bad weather is the cause of the price spike. Next, let's look at asymmetric information. Asymmetric information exists in any transaction where one party has less information than the other. Examples include Subprime mortgages, this is when a lender does not know how likely a borrower is to repay their loan. Insurance, a car insurance company cannot tell the risks associated with each single driver. The buyer of a financial product who is unaware of the true level of risk, as in the case of CDOs or shares on the stock exchange. Regulators in the financial sector who may have insufficient information compared with the bankers about the true level of risk associated with different financial products. Asymmetric information can give rise to both moral hazard and adverse selection. A good example of adverse selection is late in the credit cycle during a boom when a lender makes loans too readily available and in doing so lends to or selects borrowers who are not creditworthy and who may default once the economy slows down. This means that adverse selection leads to the accumulation of bad risks on the lender's balance sheet. Now, moral hazard. Moral hazard is about incentives, for example, providing a safety net for banks incentivizes more risk-taking. A moral hazard is a situation where a person or business is more willing to take risks to benefit themselves because any negative costs or consequences that result from a course of action will be felt by someone else. They can do this because there is asymmetric information between the parties, so the risk-taker has superior information over the one who might potentially have to bear the costs. So they can effectively get away with it. For example, to ensure economic and financial stability, governments offer banks an implicit guarantee that they will step in with extra funding to prevent a bank from collapsing. This is called an insolvency crisis. However, this creates a moral hazard since bankers will have a strong incentive to take on riskier lending behavior since they know that, whatever happens, the bank will be bailed out, by the taxpayer in this case. Sometimes this is referred to as the too-big-to-fail problem. Much of the regulatory reform of recent years has been aimed at solving this problem by bailing in bond investors in the banks who then share the losses with bank shareholders. This is intended to protect the taxpayer from funding the bank's losses. Mervyn King, then Governor of the Bank of England, said in 2007 that the provision of such liquidity support undermines the efficient pricing of risk by providing ex-post insurance for risky behavior. That encourages excessive risk-taking, and sows the seeds of a future financial crisis. Bank employees and managers have often had asymmetric compensation structures. In good years, they stood to make huge amounts of money because their bonuses were often linked to the banker's performance in generating profits for the bank. In bad years, even if the bank lost money, they would still bring home a decent salary. This gave bankers the incentive to take excessive risks because they could shift their potential losses to shareholders, who would see the share price and dividend payouts fall. Membership of the euro could also create a moral hazard. A country in the eurozone may assume that if it gets into difficulties other countries will bail it out to prevent a euro crisis. Therefore members may have higher budget deficits than they would have done since the cost of defaulting is passed on to the eurozone as a whole. Greece is a good case study of this problem since the recent general election there. Next, externalities and market rigging. Firstly, externalities. Bankers and their lending behavior did not fully take into account the external costs of managing risk. The financial sector imposed massive negative externalities on the real economy as the financial crisis triggered significant falls in GDP, rising unemployment, and falling incomes across the world economy, particularly in Europe and the US. Banks enjoyed the upside, profits during the good years, but taxpayers had to make good the losses after the crisis on account of the too-big-to-fail problem. Next, market rigging. Market rigging is illegal since it prevents a fair working of the market. There are prudential regulation and conduct regulation, which is the responsibility of the Financial Conduct Authority, the sister regulator to the PRA. Conduct is about the regulation of how financial institutions do business with their customers. An example would be foreign exchange market rigging. In November 2014, UK and US regulators handed out £2.6 billion in fines to specific banks for rigging the £3.6 trillion a day foreign exchange market. 
They found a free-for-all culture on trading floors at RBS, HSBC, Citibank, JP Morgan, and UBS. Tight-knit groups of bankers colluded on forums to share information on client activity to make cash. They bragged about making free money and bonuses, since making money for the bank led to the bankers making money for themselves. Rigging works if traders obtain confidential information about client activity that is about to happen which could change the value of a currency. The traders can then place their own orders or sales in order to profit from the subsequent movement in the value of a currency. Some research ideas around this topic could be 1. See BBC News Business, December 18, 2012, for a very clear summary on what Libra, the London Interbank Offered Rate, is and why it matters, linked to the Libra rate fixing scandal which led to large fines and a tightening of regulation. 2. Find out about the causes of the financial crisis which links closely to market failure in the financial sector. The Economist article, The Origins of the Financial Crisis, Crash Course, September 7, 2013, from the print edition, is useful. Group the causes between failures in the financial sector and failures in regulation. We will be making videos around these topics in the future. Lastly for today, the role of central banks. The key functions of central banks, such as the Bank of England, are As banker to the government. In the UK, the national debt is managed by the debt management. As banker to the banks, or as a lender of last resort. When a financially troubled bank gets into short-term difficulties and is unable to raise enough cash, the central bank will lend to them to provide the liquidity needed. The reason for this is to preserve the stability of the banking and financial system so that a run on a panic-ridden bank is prevented and individuals' deposits are protected. As part of the regulation of the banking industry, please note that not all central banks may be financial regulators. This varies from country to country. Implementation of Monetary Policy Thank you for watching our video. Please like, subscribe and share and comment below so we can clarify things for you.